Welcome to the online lecture for Chapter 3, Part 2. In this lecture, we're going to talk all about acids and bases, pH, and something called buffers. You should use this lecture in conjunction with your guided notes for Chapter 3, Part 2, which, of course, you should have completed before you come to class. There are actually four lecture points to this lecture. We're going to start by talking about the dissociation of water, and we're going to see how water relates to acids and bases. We're going to define what acids and bases are, the pH scale, and then we're going to talk about chemicals called buffers and see how they can affect pH. To understand acids and bases, we really need to talk about good old water one more time. Now, what does water have to do with acids and bases? Well, imagine that you have a jar of just pure water molecules, and they're just sitting around. In that state, water molecules will occasionally break down, and they break in a way that we call dissociation, which means that they break into two ions. Now, what's going on there? Why do they break into ions? Well, that has to do with electronegativity and the polarity of water again. When this water molecule breaks down, that greedy, greedy electronegative oxygen atom is going to steal the electron from hydrogen. And it actually kicks that little hydrogen out all by itself. So because the oxygen has gained an electron, it has a negative charge. Because the sad little hydrogen ion over here has lost its little electron, we say it has a positive charge. So the result of this reaction is an ion called hydroxide, or OH negative, and an ion called hydrogen, called H plus, or just a hydrogen ion. Now there's another weird reaction that can result from this. Sometimes those hydrogen ions that are produced will join up with other water molecules and form this weird H3O thing called hydronium, and that happens occasionally too. For our purposes, we're going to focus on this top reaction up here. So why do we care about the dissociation of water? Well, as I described in the last slide, water will dissociate or break down into two components, hydrogen ions, H+, and hydroxide ions, OH negative. H+, when you see H+, I want you to think acid. That's the major component of an acid. When you see OH negative, hydroxide, I want you to think base, because that's one of the major components of a base. So water actually contains both an acidic and a, com and a basic component. This is the reason that pure water is considered neutral, is because it has both a basic and an acidic component. One more detail that I forgot to mention that's kind of important. The hydrogen ion goes by several different names. It can just be known as a hydrogen ion. It can also be known as a proton. Now, why is that? Well, let's think about hydrogen. Here's the little nucleus of hydrogen. Here's its electron shell. It has an atomic number of one, so it has one little electron. If it loses that electron, as it does in this case, it's going to have no electrons. So really, that is just a little tiny proton with a sad little positive charge floating around in space. For that reason, we can call hydrogen ions protons. So sometimes you'll hear me refer to them that way. Now let's consider what happens when we reverse this reaction. If we take some acid, some hydrogen ions, and some hydroxide and put them together, they get together in such a way that forms water again. The negative of the hydroxide is going to be attracted to the positive of that little hydrogen, so they're going to get together and form good old neutral water. For this reason, when you combine an acid and a base together, we call this a neutralization reaction. Chemicals that we refer to as acids and bases are made of more than just water. Of course, they have other chemical components. So what happens when we combine an acid and a base together? Well, here's a good example. Here we have an acid, hydrochloric acid. 
and here we have sodium hydroxide, a base. When you mix hydrochloric acid with water, it will dissociate into two components, hydrogen ions and chlorine ions that are negative. Sodium hydroxide will also dissociate when you mix it with water. It will turn into sodium ions that are negative, or sorry, positive, and hydroxide ions that are negative. What happens when we combine these things together? Well, if you mix this acid with this base, what's going to happen is that the hydrogen ions are going to be attracted to the hydroxide ions, and they are going to end up forming good old water. That's what we saw before. Now, what about the other two components? Well, the chlorine ions and the sodium ions are going to be attracted to one another, and so that's going to form an ionic bond, and we call that good old table salt, NaCl. So, in general, the two products of a neutralization reaction are salts, like this table salt, although there can be others. Remember, salt refers to a classification of chemicals, not just table salt. And the other product is going to be water, which we spoke about before. So, salt and water. The presence of these acids and bases can have a dramatic effect on life. Um, it can affect how your cells function, how your bodies function, and it can affect how ecosystems function. Here we have a couple of dramatic examples. Here we have a volcanic lake. It's located in Ethiopia, and it's extremely acidic. And from the air, you can see that the water is even kind of green looking. Here's another example of a really cool environment. This is Lake Natron in Tanzania, and um, it's extremely alkaline. There are certain sections of this lake that are so alkaline that wildlife that stumble into it sort of become mummified. So what we're seeing here is a mummified flamingo, and there's some very dramatic photographs of different kinds of wildlife that died around this lake. Now we do have environments sort of like this in the United States. There are alkaline lakes in Utah, for instance. Um, but for the most part, we're going to talk about things that are a little bit more subtle, the effects on individual cells, for instance. Let's define what an acid is. Now you might be familiar with acids such as citric acid or carbonic acid. These are things you find in citrus fruit and sodas and things like Topo Chico has a lot of carbonic acid in it. Acids tend to be um, a little sour in taste and they can be corrosive if they're really strong. Chemically speaking, an acid is any chemical that releases hydrogen ions into a solution. Now, because hydrogen ions are also known as protons, acids are also known as proton donors, so they give away hydrogens. Here we can see this with hydrochloric acid, good old HCl. When it's mixed with other chemicals, it tends to dissociate, and it will release chlorine ions that are negative, and here's that good old acid component. Here's our protons. So this is a proton donor. Next, let's define bases. In everyday life, you might be familiar with bases such as baking soda or ammonia. Bases tend to have a bitter flavor. Um, they also tend to have a slippery feel on the skin. We also know bases as being alkaline. So alkaline chemicals are basic. Now what are they and what do they do? Well, bases can actually act in two different ways. They can act by increasing the hydroxide concentration within a solution, or they can reduce the amount of hydrogen that's in a solution. Because they can take up and remove protons, H+, from solution, we also know them as proton acceptors. Let's look at a couple of different examples of bases and see these different actions.
One way that a chemical can act as a base is by releasing hydroxide ions. So here, for instance, we have sodium hydroxide. This is a base that you will play with in lab. When it dissociates, when you mix it with another chemical, it tends to break into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. That's our basic component right there. Now, why do we care about that? Well, this is important because hydroxide ions can interact with hydrogen ions to form water. So if there's any acid in a solution, the hydroxide ions will interact with it and take it up and neutralize it and form water. So a base here is acting as a base by removing hydrogen, and it can do that because it released hydroxide. Another action that bases can take is by directly taking up hydrogen ions, directly accepting protons. Here, for instance, we have NH3 or ammonia. And what it's going to do is it's going to interact with hydrogen in the solution. So if you mix ammonia with an acid, it will take this hydrogen and it will stick it onto itself and form this weird thing called ammonium, which does have a positive charge, NH4. Because it added that hydrogen to itself, that hydrogen is no longer floating around in solution, acting like an acid. So this chemical is acting as a base. It's removing protons from the solution. Time for a your turn. Now this your turn is going to take you a little bit of time, but that's okay. I think it's really going to help you understand and visualize the actions of acids and bases. What I would like you to do is visit this link, and I did put this link both on the guided notes and in the comment that you'll see to the left of the screen. I want you to answer the questions that are on the guided notes and work your way through this module for the sections that say acids and bases, and then come back to the lecture. Let's talk about the concentration of hydrogen and hydroxide in pure water. By the way, this symbol, the brackets, represents concentration in chemistry. So that means the concentration of hydrogen ions. This means the concentration of hydroxide ions. Now I told you that if you had a sample of pure water, that the dissociation of those molecules occurs very rarely. So if we were to measure the concentration of the hydrogen ions and the concentration of the hydroxide ions in a sample of pure water, we'd find about this many, this many grams per liter, which is the same as saying molar, molarity. Now that number is difficult to understand, so we put it in scientific notation and we get 10 to the negative 14 molar. In other words, how much hydrogen and hydroxide can we find in a typical sample of pure water? 10 to the negative 14 molar. Now this 14 is important because of this number, our, our pH scale, which we use to measure acids and bases, is only going to go up to 14. 14 is the upper limit for this. 14 is going to be your magic number for this section. Another thing that's important to understand is that the concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide in any solution are indirectly related. So that means that as the concentration of hydrogen goes up, the concentration of hydroxide tends to go down, and vice versa. We can use this to help us determine the concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide in a solution. For instance, if we have a solution and we've measured that the hydrogen concentration is 10 to the negative fifth molar, then that means that the hydroxide concentration is going to be 10 to the negative 9 molar. Now, how did I know that? Well, 5 plus 9 equals 14, and 14 is our magic number. Next, let's talk about the pH scale. The pH scale is sort of a simplified way of describing how much acid or how much base is present in a solution. Now we've got two chemicals we could measure, right? We've got hydrogen and we've got hydroxide. 
So which one does the pH scale use to measure this? Oh, that's terrible. Well, it uses hydrogen ions. This is all based around the presence of hydrogen. Now here's the formula for the pH scale. pH is equal to the negative log base 10 of the hydrogen concentration. So what does that mean and why do they use this crazy system? Well, consider this. If we had a solution and we knew that its concentration of hydrogen was 0 0.001 molar, that's a little bit difficult to understand. Now, we could simplify that and say that it's 10 to the negative 3 molar. That's a little easier to understand, but still kind of hard to wrap your head around. If you take that number and you put it into this formula, it's going to tell you that the pH is equal to 3. 3 is a number that's easy to understand. So that's the reason that they use this uh, complicated formula is because it takes these big crazy numbers and it turns them into numbers that are easy to understand. When you are given the hydrogen concentration, I want you to remember that the pH is going to be the same as the exponent. So if you're told that the hydrogen concentration is 10 to the negative 3, remember that the pH is going to be 3. pH is recorded in positive numbers only, so if there's a negative on that exponent, you just ditch it. And the scale goes from 0 to 14. How do we read the pH scale? Well, let's start right here in the middle. Chemicals that are neutral have a pH of 7, and water is a great example of that. Now remember that water has an equal concentration of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. That's what makes it neutral. Acids are chemicals that have a pH of less than 7, so 7 all the way down towards 0. And acids are going to have more hydrogen than hydroxide. They have more hydrogen than hydroxide. If we add hydrogen to a solution, it becomes more and more acidic, and its pH is going to get closer to zero. So closer to zero means more acidic. Now on the opposite end of the scale, we have bases. Bases span from 7 up to 14. Bases are going to have more hydroxide than hydrogen. If we either removed hydrogen from solution, or we added more hydroxide, which does the same thing, the pH is going to get higher. So less hydrogen means a higher pH number. More hydroxide also means a higher pH number on the scale. Incidentally, living things tend to have pHs of between 6 and 8, depending on the type of cell you're talking about. There are exceptions to this. Of course, the inside of the stomach is somewhere between 0 and 2, and that's just normal for the stomach. Because the pH scale is logarithmic, it's a base 10 system. That means that if I move from one number to another on the pH scale, I'm changing by a factor of 10. So let's consider these examples. Let's consider a solution with pH of 6 versus a a solution with pH of 7. The solution with the pH of 6 is going to have 10 times more hydrogen in that solution than the pH of 7. If I go from 7 down to 5, well it's going to have 10 100 times more hydrogen in it than a solution with pH of 7. So it changes by a factor of 10. I'd like to have you practice with this a little bit more before you move on. So see if you can use that pH scale, that base 10 system, and answer these questions. The last thing we need to consider in this chapter are these things that we call buffers. Buffers are chemicals found in natural systems. We also use them in the lab. And what they do is stabilize pH. 
they minimize changes in hydrogen and hydroxide concentration in a solution. Now buffers consist of both an acidic component and a basic component, and they kind of work together to keep the pH at a certain range. The basic component will accept hydrogen ions when they are in excess. So if the pH of a solution starts to go down because there's more hydrogen all of a sudden, these chemicals will absorb that hydrogen and raise the pH back up. So it's about at the same level. The acidic component of a base, or a buffer rather, will actually release hydrogen ions um, when they are depleted. So if the pH starts to go up in a solution, meaning that the hydrogen ions are all being taken up, the acidic component can release hydrogen and make that pH go back down. So it's at about the same level. The most common buffering system found in your body is called the bicarbonate buffering system, sometimes called the carbonic acid buffering system. Where does it come from? Well, you have water in your blood. You know, you're made of about 70% water. And your tissues are constantly producing CO2. CO2 is a waste product. When water and CO2 combine, they make this chemical called carbonic acid. Now, carbonic acid can be useful as a buffer in the, uh, in the body because what it can do is it can break down into an acid component and a basic component known as bicarbonate. Now, why is that useful? Well, let's say that the pH of your blood starts to go down. You start to build up a little too much hydrogen. The bicarbonate portion of this system will take up that hydrogen and bring the pH back up. Let's say that the opposite is happening. You've got a little too much hydroxide building up in the system or your hydrogen's disappearing. The acidic component of this system will begin to release hydrogen and that will help bring the pH back down. So it stays at about the same level. Now ideally you want your blood chemistry to stay at about 7.4 and that's what this system does. There's this pseudoscience-y idea floating around on the internet known as the alkaline diet. The alkaline diet claims that your body has a particular pH and that it's healthful to maintain this pH by eating foods that are also at that pH. Now there's several things wrong with this. Your body doesn't have one pH. Different organs have different pHs depending on what their job is. For instance, the stomach is very, very acidic but the small intestines tend to be pretty basic because they have different jobs. Also, your body has these different buffering systems in place to maintain the pH of different organs. So no matter what you eat, your body has ways of dealing with the acidity and alkalinity of these chemicals. Now, it's not to say that eating really acidic food all the time is good for you. You know, things that are high in acids can increase tooth decay, and they can cause um, heartburn if you have problems with that. But in general, no matter what food you eat, your blood pH is going to stay at 7.4 because that's what your body does. As long as your kidneys and your lungs are functioning well, your blood pH is going to be just fine. Now, I am not a doctor, so if you have concerns about your diet, if you have concerns about your body, go and ask an actual doctor. But in general, it's fine to not buy products um, that use this pseudoscience idea, things like alkaline water that are supposed to be healthier. Um, people buy pH strips, and they carefully test the pH of all their foods. That's pseudoscience as well. You don't have to do this to remain healthy. But again, if you have concerns, go see an actual medical doctor. In this your turn, I would like you to return to that acids, bases, and buffers learning module and work your way through the buffers section. This can get a little complicated, so take your time with it and answer the questions that are in your guided notes, and we'll work with it more once we get into the class. This is the end of this chapter, so once you've completed this, you are ready to come to class and do the work. We'll see you then.